going to start with a, a trick question, perhaps, but a, a question I want you to think about. Who was the more deserving of eternal reward? Peter, James and John, three of the greatest heroes of faith who gave up their lives for Jesus, or a low-life thief who only turned to Christ when he was about to die? Now keep that question in your minds because we're going to come back to it later. And it helps to set up Jesus' parable here in Matthew 20. A parable that concerns the unfair generosity of God. Now, the reason for this parable is found in the second half of Matthew 19, where Jesus is met by this rich young ruler. He's an impressive young man, he's morally upright, and he sincerely believes that he's kept all the requirements of the law. So he asks, teacher, what good thing must I do to get eternal life? I mean, is there anything else for me to do? And incredibly, Jesus says, oh, yes, there is. If you want to be perfect, go, sell your possessions and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come and follow me. So what Jesus has done there is outlined the true way of discipleship. And that is not outward adherence to the law, but it's to give up all the treasures in our hearts and to make Jesus our treasure. Because if you do, and here Jesus makes this young man an unbelievable offer, if you give up your earthly treasures that means so much to you, you will gain so much more because you'll gain treasure in heaven. And the young man leaves with great sadness in his heart because you see he had great wealth. And for all his moral uprightness, he was attached to his wealth. It was part of his identity. He couldn't imagine life without all that security and all that status. And it prompts that very famous comment of Jesus. It is easier for a camel to do the impossible, to go through the eye of a needle, than it is for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. As we saw last time, unrighteous mammon is a great snare. Now, the disciples are listening and they're astonished because for them, in their society, wealth was a sign of God's blessing. And so if the rich are excluded from heaven, well, what hope is there for anyone else? And, and Jesus agrees with them. If qualifying for heaven depends upon human worthiness and achievement, well, it is indeed impossible. You may as well ask a camel to go through an eye of a needle. But it doesn't depend on that. It depends upon the grace of God. And the grace of God knows no obstacle. With man, yes, this is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. You can forget human categories of worth or measurement of performance. God's grace is mighty to save. Now, at this point, the conversation takes a twist. As usual, Peter is speaking on behalf of the others, whether he's been asked to or not. And he says out loud what each of them is thinking. We have left everything to follow you. What then will there be for us? Now, translated, Peter is saying, look, Jesus, you promised that young man treasure in heaven if he gave up his wealth and he failed that test. But we haven't failed it. We've given up everything to follow you. Our lives are at your service. So what about that treasure in heaven? What about our reward? Now, I, I put it slightly more crassly than Peter puts it, but I think you get the point. On the one hand, they're looking for reassurance that their real sacrifices would not go unrewarded. But there's something a little bit ugly there as well. They kind of want to receive special honour, recognition, and if you wonder where I'm getting that from, well, we only have to flick forward another chapter or so, another few verses, and uh, Peter, uh, James and John are, are asking Jesus if they can be in special places at his right hand in heaven. And then the, the rest of the disciples hear it and they're indignant. These are conceited men, proud men, jostling for position. Where's our special place in heaven going to be? And what Jesus does is give them an answer here that both reassures them and challenges their pride. 
So yes, they will receive great reward, no doubt about it. They will have places of honour in God's kingdom, but not just them, everybody else. Everyone who has left houses, or brothers, or sisters, or father, or mother, or children, or fields, for my sake, will receive a hundred times as much, and will inherit eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and many who are last will be first. Now that last sentence is a proverb, it's a, a riddle, if you like, an enigmatic saying. What's it mean? Well, Jesus amplifies it for us by telling the parable we have here in Matthew 20. And here's the parable. We have a landowner, he's got a vineyard. Grapes were planted in the spring, pruned in the uh, summer, and then the crop would be brought in in the, in the harvest, around September time. Now, given that the rainy season would start very quickly, immediately after that, it's a small window to get in that crop. And so it's all hands on deck to make sure it's gathered in. And so the landowner realises he needs additional workers, so he goes to the marketplace, the nearest public place. It, it's a place he knows he's going to find men, those who aren't professional servants who are attached to a household, they're unemployed, unskilled labourers. They're desperate for a daily wage to merely stay alive. And the marketplace is the equivalent, I suppose, of the temp agency. So the landowner goes down very early in the morning, soon after sunrise, and sure enough, there are men there already. It's a sign of their desperate need for work. And it's the, the principle of the early bird catches the worm. The landowner immediately hires them. And what's more, he agrees to pay them a denarius. Now that's extremely generous because the denarius was the standard pay for a professional household servant or a soldier in the Roman army. It, it was very respectable money. It was a good rate. It wasn't the kind of money you'd pay a temp for a day's work. But it's a, a measure of the man, this landowner who's generous with his money. Now he's clearly got a big vineyard and there's clearly a lot of work to do because he's back at the marketplace at 9am, the third hour, three hours after sunrise. He gets some more men and he does the same at noon, which is the sixth hour. And then at three in the afternoon, that's the ninth hour. And there are more and more men joining his band of workers. But as daylight begins to run out, there's still work to be done. So he returns to the marketplace at the proverbial 11th hour, around 5 p.m., and there are still men standing about. Not because they're idle, they're not slackers, it's simply because they haven't been offered work. It's a bit like the school kid who's chosen last for the football team. It may be that these men were considered less desirable. Perhaps they'd been deliberately passed over. But, but the landowner needs all the help he can get, and so they too are enlisted. They're hired. Well, as the sun goes down, as evening draws in, the working day ends. And as was common practice, the foreman calls the workers over and begins to deal out their wages. Now, rather unusually, he starts by paying those who had joined latest, and the original workers who've been there since sunrise have to wait, but they get paid. The problem is, it becomes clear that when everyone's received their wage, everybody has been paid the identical amount. It's the same wage for everyone, one denarius. And uh, if a denarius was a generous enough salary for a day temp, well, it's untold riches for someone who's only worked for an hour. And perhaps not surprisingly, those original workers are offended. They don't see this as generosity at all. They see it as unfair and unjust. And, and they grumble openly. This isn't fair. These men who were hired last, they only worked one hour. Yet you've made them equal to us and we've been there slaving away for the heat of the day. What are you going to give us? 
Now, the landowner is, a, is a, a winsome sort of guy, and he doesn't want to fall out with these people, and he addresses their lead spokesman, spokesman and he says, friend. So he's, not, he's non-confrontational. Friend, I'm not being unfair to you. Didn't you agree to work for a denarius? It's clearly stated those are the terms. Take your pay. Go. I want to give the man who was hired last the same as I gave you. Don't I have the right to do what I want with my own money? Or are you envious because I'm generous? And there's nothing to be said. There's nothing that can be said. After all, this man is the owner. It's his money. It's his choice. Nobody's been shortchanged. Far from it. And that's all there is to it. And summing up, Jesus says, So... The last will be first, and the first will be last. It's another proverb, another riddle, just like the one at the beginning. And it's saying the same sort of thing. So if we tie those two verses together, the parable is bookended with this saying. Many who are first will be last, and many who are last will be first. So the last will be first, and the first will be last. Now what's it mean? We know, for example, that in Mark 9, Jesus says, if anyone wants to be first, he must be the very last and the servant of all. And in Mark 10, he says, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be slave of all. Now, in those two verses and um, passages, Jesus is very clearly speaking about an attitude of humility, of self-denial, something that we see supremely in Christ's life. Something that we should all have if we're following Christ. We should esteem others as better. We should put them first. Now that's not the point that Jesus is making here. It's a different point. In fact, the last will be first and the first will be last is merely a statement of fact. Think of a, a race where every competitor, regardless of where they started, finishes at exactly the same time. Now, we'd have a phrase for that. We'd call it a dead heat. Nobody wins, and yet everybody wins. The last to first, the first to last. There's a basic equality. And so it is in this parable. Those who strived in the vineyard for 12 hours and those who only worked for one hour, they received the same payment. There's a basic equality. Everybody wins. Everybody gets the prize. And when it comes to being a disciple of Jesus, nobody loses out and everybody wins. Peter and the other disciples, well, they wanted to feel unique and special because we've, we're your disciples. We've been marked out as special and we want that pride of place and glory that, that makes everybody else realise that we're special. And Jesus says, well, you're nothing special. That's the point. Remember why you've been chosen. It's all of grace. And that's what this parable is really all about. The basis of our salvation, the currency of the Christian life, grace. God's unmerited favour to us. The landowner symbolises sovereign almighty God. And the vineyard is a picture of God's kingdom, his realm, the sphere of his rule. The workers in the vineyard are Christians, people like us, those chosen of God to enter into his service, not through any merit of their own, but chosen because of divine grace and love. Through the atoning death of Christ, God has brought us into his kingdom of light and he set us to work in his vineyard, his world. And until the evening draws in and the daytime of our lives ends, we're called to serve him. We're saved to serve. And we're all under the authority of the same Lord and Master. We all have the same spirit indwelling us. We've all been given access to the same grace. And yet our service will vary. How we use our gifts for the Lord will vary. Our circumstances, our trials, our successes, our failures. It all looks very different from one believer to the next. And yet regardless, at the end of the working day, either when death comes for us 
or the Lord returns first out of the sky, we all alike receive our reward, eternal life, a place in God's paradise forever with the Lord. Amen. And here's the thing. That reward is not dependent upon the length of your Christian service, the quality and consistency of your Christian service, the fame or notoriety of your Christian service. Let's come back to my opening question. Who was the more deserving, the more meritous of, of, of eternal reward? Was it Peter, James and John, three of the great heroes of faith? who sacrificed all for Jesus? Or was it that low-life thief who only turned to Christ when he was about to die? Now, from a human perspective, we would say that Peter, James and John were far better Christians than the dying thief. They achieved far more. They led more people to Jesus. They discipled people for Jesus. They wrote parts of God's inspired word. They were martyred for Christ. Whereas the dying thief, well, he lived a life of crime and he was put on the cross for his life of crime. And by the time he turned to Jesus, he didn't have time to be baptised, to write an epistle, to witness for Jesus, to live a godly life. And cynically, we might say, well, he only turned to Jesus because he knew he was hours away from dying and going into eternity. And yet that poor wretched man on that cross did all that any person can ever do. He turned to Jesus and he depended upon Jesus alone for salvation. And therefore, he received the same reward as three other sinners, Peter, James and John. The same reward that we will receive as sinners trusting in Christ. Eternal life with Christ. Everybody wins. Now, I know that there are other passages in the Bible which appear to speak of degrees of reward for the saints in heaven and uh, the parable of the talents in Matthew 25 is one such example but that's not about who's going to have the biggest mansion or the biggest crown on their head perhaps the the better word to use is degrees of responsibility clearly some will be trusted with greater responsibility in the eternal realm you have been faithful with a few things I will put you in charge of many things. That's the principle. But as for the actual reward, salvation, eternal life in heaven with Christ rather than everlasting hell, well, it's the same for all Christians. There are not classes of Christian. There are not first class Christians who are greater and second class Christians who are less so. Eternal life is not like the social club where there are gold members who have greater access to the privileges because of who they are and what they've done. And, you know, you, you go to the club and no, that's out of bounds over there because you're not a gold member, you're just a blue tack member. So, you, you know, you don't get that part of the club. It's not like that, is it? It's not like that. Responsibilities in eternity may vary, but the reward itself is not dependent upon any of the human distinctions or variables that we might use to assess the performance of a Christian. The reward is dependent quite simply on Christ, his atoning blood, his resurrection life. Now, is that fair? What about the faithful believer who served the Lord fearlessly on the mission field for 50 years? Shouldn't there be some special kind of reward to distinguish him over the person who only trusted Jesus at the end of a life of reckless sin and rebellion? Well, there are two answers to that. First of all, it was only by God's grace that the missionary served the Lord for 50 years. He couldn't have done it in his own strength. And second, that missionary will still receive great reward, reward beyond measure. He's not going to lose out. You never lose out for serving the Lord. Remember how the landowner offered a denarius each to those temp workers, these unskilled labourers. And I, I said, didn't I, that that alone was unbelievable for just one day's work. And so far from being treated unfairly, those that had worked the whole day were still indebted to that landowner. 
the one who chose them, for they didn't choose him. The one who rewarded them so extravagantly. And in the same way, Jesus is telling us that God is no man's debtor. Nobody deserves eternal life. No one is entitled to God's eternal reward. And if it was a simple case of fairness, the way we see fairness, nobody would enter heaven. Not you, not me, not anybody. All have sinned. All fall short of the glory of God. But God's grace is extraordinary. It does the impossible. It squares the circle. It creates a way for people who were enemies in their minds, dead in their transgressions and sins, to be saved. And of course, Jesus is that way. It's the greatest irony that the only man who's ever lived who deserved eternal life, yet he was cut off from the land of the living and received eternal death on the cross. So that through him, all who trust him may enter God's vineyard and serve him for an unbelievable reward at the end. Eternal life. And just as those vineyard labourers didn't deign to, to work in that vineyard, oh, I've got nothing else to do, I think I'll choose to work there. They were chosen. They were desperate, they were plucked off the scrap heap. And it's the same with us. We've been chosen. In and of ourselves, we'd never have chosen to trust Jesus, would we? We'd have trusted a myriad of other things, our own gifts, our own talents, our money, our possessions, perhaps our family and friends. We wouldn't have chosen to trust Jesus. We chose to because he first chose us. He died for us while we were still sinners. And in fact, he marked us out before the world was even created. Ephesians 1 says, he chose us in him before the creation of the world. To use the pitch of the vineyard, it's like even before the vineyard was planted, this owner had decided exactly who he was going to choose to work there. Why did the Lord do this? Because he did. He just did. I think the Lord would echo the answer of the landowner. Don't I have the right to do what I want with my own money? Or are you envious because I'm generous? And the Lord, of course, is extravagantly, lavishly generous, beyond any measurement of generosity. And no, the dying thief, he didn't deserve it. And neither did that reckless sinner who's lived a life of shame and is only converted on his deathbed. And neither did Peter, James and John. Neither did that long-serving missionary. And neither do you or I. But in grace, the sovereign holy God chose a people to be his. A vast number. And every hour of the day, as long as it's day, we're seeing more and more people being brought into his kingdom to serve in his vineyard. Now some, I'm afraid to say, won't serve particularly effectively. Some won't serve for very long. There may be some who trust and believe in Jesus, maybe a few minutes before Jesus comes out of the sky and returns to end all things. And they're only just in time. And it doesn't matter. Because all discipleship is a matter of God's grace. And the reward for discipleship is always eternal life and a place of honour in God's kingdom. And it's open to all who believe. And it's more than we deserve. And it's more than enough. Perhaps Peter and the others at that moment didn't think it would be. They, they needed some more recognition. But, you know, when the saints stand in glory around the throne room of God, when we're there, there aren't going to be any envious eyes. There's not going to be any jealousy, no comparisons. To just be there and to see our Lord and Saviour, that will be enough. There's a hymn that puts it like this. The bride eyes not her garment, but her dear bridegroom's face. I will not gaze at glory, but on my King of grace, not at the crown he gifted, but on his pierced hand. The Lamb is all the glory of Emmanuel's land. So where does that leave us? Well, I'm just going to give you four very quick suggestions, lessons we can take away. And first is this, that there should be no place for envy or for competition in our Christian lives with other believers. 
there is a rather ugly expression, isn't there, in verse 15? Are you envious because I'm generous? And the New King James Version puts it like this. Is your eye evil because I am good? And there is something of this in Peter's question to the Lord. It's a, an ugly question. There's, there's conceit and pride there. Salvation is not by human endeavour. God's sovereign over it. Why doesn't God save absolutely everyone? Why are some saved so late in their lives? Well, that's a matter for him. And we're not to speculate over the secret things of the Lord and allow it to cause division or competition among us. I mean, the wonder is that anyone, including me and you, can be saved. And that should be enough. I'm reminded of another occasion where the risen Lord is talking to Peter about the kind of death he's going to die. And it's a pretty horrible death. It's crucifixion. And John is there sort of walking with them. And Peter turns around and says, well, what about him? If I'm going to have to die a horrible death, what about John? And Jesus says, what's that to you? To put it less politely, mind your own business. I mean, if, if he lives and doesn't die until I come, that, what's that to you? It's none of your business. You see, God deals with individuals. And while the end destination is the same and the saviour is the same, it looks different for each person in this life. It's not a case of fairness. It's a case of divine wisdom. So for our part, let's revel in the salvation and let's not be sidetracked or consumed by pointless comparisons. Because secondly, there is still work to be done, isn't there? The evening, the end of the day, that's when Christ returns. But for as long as it remains the gospel day, we remain labourers in the Lord's vineyard. Faithful discipleship today does not go unnoticed. And the Lord will commend and reward it in eternity. So rather than getting distracted by looking at the Christian performance of somebody else and why aren't they doing what I'm doing, may we keep the Lord as our focus individually and let us do the works and be the people we were chosen in advance of the world to do and to be but thirdly even as we're doing that even as we're serving let's remind ourselves again we're not saved by our works or our christian performance and our very best works even if they're brilliant aren't going to change our final destination because that was decided by the lord and by his grace alone. And that is a wonder. Just re remember again that the picture of the kind of person that the landowner brings into his vineyard, those on the scrap heap, destitute, unemployed, perhaps even unemployable, no merit of their own, but they're graciously brought in. And Christ, he did not come to save the righteous. He came to save sinners. Now all have sinned, but not all realise it. All fall short. Not all realise it. Like the rich young ruler, they are self-sufficient. They believe they're good. But it's only the person who comes to the end of themselves and realises, I need a doctor, I'm ill, I'm sick. In fact, I'm dead. I need a saviour. Only that person will be saved. And even after decades, perhaps, serving the Lord... That is still you, isn't it? You know, you might have been a Christian for, for 60, 70 years, as long as the Queen has been on the throne. But you're still a helpless sinner and you're still having to trust in the Saviour. Never lose sight of grace. And if you've never trusted before, that's the way to heaven. Not your works, not being baptised, not becoming a church member, not going on a pilgrimage, looking up and trusting in the Lord Jesus, coming to him with empty hands. Nothing in my hand I bring, simply to thy cross I cling. That's the way to heaven. Never lose sight of grace. It's as uh, the great John Newton once said, he was coming to the end of his life, and he famously said, although my memory's fading, I remember two things very clearly. I'm a great sinner, but Christ is a great saviour. And then, just fourthly and finally, I think we can be reassured because that was really what Peter and the others wanted. They had given up everything for the Lord. And 
They were asking, is it worth it? Is it worth being a Christian? Well, is there anybody in this parable who doesn't receive payment? Does anybody get shortchanged? And the answer, of course, is no. The master keeps his promise and then some. And as believers, I can, I can say to you this morning, the Lord will keep his promise to you. It will be worth it. The promise is certain because the promise maker is the faithful, steadfast king of love. And he never breaks his promises. And he's promised to never leave you, and nor to forsake you, and, and to keep you from falling, and one day present you faultless before the throne of grace with exceeding joy. That's what he's promised, and that's what he will do because of who he is. And if there's any change to the promise, it's simply one of perception on our part. Because I think when we do arrive in glory, we will realise that the promise was far greater than anything we could ever have asked for or imagined. But for the moment, as we wait for heaven, and it sometimes seems dim, Christ is always worth it. He's wonderful. He'll look after you. And one day, it will be greater than you can imagine. So be reassured, um, friends, today, that the Lord is not like us. He keeps his promises. And the payment for trusting him is, is wonderful. Amen.